Thank you, Valentina, for the kind introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here today. Uh, I must also thank Helmut and Christoph and the RCC staff for the chance to be in residence um, here in Munich. It's been inspiring not only on a scholarly level, but also in terms of becoming a more informed and active global citizen. Uh, so thank you. So the title of my presentation today is Conquest versus Adaptation, Permafrost and Socialist Industrialization in the Soviet Union. And I want to take us to a very different time and place from where we are now. I want to take us to the Soviet Union, the world's first socialist society, um, a place that no longer exists today, and also to the 1920s and 30s, a time when the Soviet Union was undergoing rapid, um, fast-paced economic transformation under the command of a communist regime. I'd like to introduce this time and place by means of a quotation from a primary source, uh, since historians love primary sources. The source is an article from the journal Socialist Transport entitled Problems of Construction in Regions of Frozen Earth. The article was written by a Soviet engineer named Yelenevsky, and it gives us a sense of some frustration on Yelenevsky's part. He writes that the exploitation of the natural wealth of the North, riches like appetite, forest land, fisheries and furs, coal, minerals, copper, gold, platinum, and other resources was being stymied by the basic difficulty of guaranteeing stable roads on frozen ground. He described amateur methods of construction, shoddiness of the roadbed, and weakness in a number of built structures. Who was to blame? Yelenevsky had an answer. Trotskyist, rightists, and other enemies of the people, wreckers and saboteurs who were conspiring to break down all work directed toward the mastery of the northern and eastern peripheries of the Soviet Union. So Yelenevsky's words clue us into a few important observations. First, that in the Soviet Union during the 1920s and 30s, nature was perceived as a resource to be exploited. Second, that while striving to exploit natural resources, people also discovered that nature presented obstacles, in this case, frozen earth. And finally, that exploiting nature and confronting the obstacles presented by nature were issues of tremendous political importance in the Soviet Union, hence the mention of Trotskyist, rightists, and other enemies of the people. Perceptions, practices, and politics, these elements are central to the story I want to tell today. So today I want to shine light on the relationship between humans and environment in the Soviet Union by focusing on the phenomenon that caused Yelenevsky so much frustration, uh, frozen earth, or in Russian, Vyshna Mezlata, or as we call it today, permafrost. First, I will explain what permafrost is and why and how it became such a problem for the Soviet state in the 1920s and 30s. What made permafrost politically important in the Soviet Union? Next, I will focus on perceptions. How was permafrost portrayed in Soviet propaganda and discourse? I will highlight the dominance of what I call the rhetoric of conquest, a discursive framework that posited permafrost and nature more generally as something to be struggled against and defeated. Finally, I'll look at practice. How did Soviet scientists and engineers actually interact with permafrost on the ground? <laughs> My overall argument here is that even though Soviet propaganda talked the conquest of nature, Soviet scientists and engineers in fact practiced adaptation. Here I'm defining adaptation as the process of accommodating human ambitions to the constraints and opportunities of the non-human world. Contrary to the rhetoric of conquest, Soviet scientists and engineers looked for methods to circumvent the problems of permafrost, sometimes by strengthening and actively maintaining permafrost. Why does this story of adaptation and the disconnect between rhetoric and practice matter? Well, the story of adaptation is not the way the environmental history of the Soviet Union has typically been told. The environmental history of the Soviet Union has typically been told as a story of degradation and ecocide. What probably comes to mind are the iconic examples of the shrinking of the Aral Sea and the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. The narrative de of degradation often traces these negative outcomes back to callous attitudes toward nature held by the Soviet regime. 
The argument is that the desire to conquer nature promoted ecologically destructive policies that led to environmental degradation. So I'd like to step in and point out that rhetoric and practice were not, in fact, always consistent. I want to push back against an overly monolithic picture of the Soviet Union's environmental history by looking more carefully at specific instances of human interactions with the environment. Hopefully, this can give us a more nuanced perspective. So my goal is certainly not to defend or exonerate the Soviet regime. Um, rather, I'd like for us to see the Soviet experience as part of a common tragedy and a shared conundrum uh, in which we too take part. So at the end of my talk, I offer some reflections about what the story of permafrost and the Soviet Union suggests about the relationship between humans and environment today. Okay, so let's begin with what is permafrost. Uh, scientists today define permafrost as ground, that is soil or rock and included ice and organic material that remains at or below zero degrees Celsius for at least two consecutive years. Uh, to use simpler language, permafrost is earth that stays frozen all the time, throughout the year, across the seasons, even during the summer. You might have heard about permafrost in the context of conversations about global warming. Journalists have described permafrost as a methane time bomb. This is because rising global temperatures are causing frozen earth to thaw. As a result, methane that is currently trapped within permafrost will be emitted into the atmosphere. This will create a positive feedback loop. Um, with additional billions of tons of greenhouse gas in circulation, global warming will be accelerated, leading to further thawing and more releases of methane. And given the potentially devastating consequences of climate change, permafrost has become a global concern in the 21st century. In the 1930s, however, the Soviet state was concerned about permafrost for rather different reasons, not because of global warming, but because of socialist industrialization. The program of socialist industrialization began in 1927 with the first five-year plan. Uh, the Soviet regime under Stalin aimed to transform a largely agrarian country into an industrial power. What made industrialization socialist? Well, I'll just remind us of a few relevant things. One, it was carried out in the name of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which was embodied by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, also known as the Bolshevik Party, which was guided by the ideology of Marxism-Leninism and which had a monopoly on power. Two, socialist industrialization happened not through private enterprise, but according to a planned economy organized by the state. Um, and the state, set, uh, the state set production quotas for various sectors of the economy, time frames for achieving these quotas, and prices for their products. Finally, socialist industrialization emphasized heavy industry and not consumer goods. Resources were purposefully funneled into steel, chemicals, machines, and infrastructure, and not socks and spoons, for example. <laughs> so. Socialist industrialization was politically important for several reasons. First, it was necessary to build the industrial capacity in order to improve the material foundations of life for people. It was also important to integrate people into socialist society by having them participate in industrialization. Finally, industrialization would enable this new socialist society to defend itself against hostile capitalist encirclement. Uh, as Stalin famously said in 1931, one feature of the history of old Russia was the continual beatings she suffered because of her backwardness. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or we shall be crushed. So industrialization, industrialization was clearly a political priority for the Soviet regime. Juxtaposed with these grand ambitions was permafrost. Uh, due to geographical accident, vast stretches of the territory of the Soviet Union was underlain by permafrost. According to Soviet scientists, 10 million square kilometers, approximately 48% of the USSR, was situated atop frozen Earth. By comparison, Canada had 6 million square kilometers of permafrost, Greenland had 1.9 million square kilometers, Alaska had 1.1 million square kilometers. So permafrost was more widespread in the Soviet Union than in other states. 
It also became a matter of state concern earlier in the USSR than elsewhere. Within the Soviet Union, the 10 million square kilometers of permafrost were spread across the north and the east. It was not only an Arctic phenomenon, it could be found far to the south, up to and beyond the border with China and Mongolia. This region of permafrost was ecologically diverse and very sparsely populated, less than one person per square kilometer in 1927. So this very large, very diverse, and very remote region was supposed to transform into a land of urban centers and heavy industry under the five-year plans. To realize this vision, state agencies began building infrastructure and extracting mineral resources all across the north and east. In Forkuta, above the Arctic Circle just west of the Ural Mountains, a coal mining complex was created. Farther east in the Arctic, Norilsk became a center for metals mining. In the upper reaches of the Kalima River in eastern Siberia, gold and tin were mined. The remote town of Yakutsk, uh, capital of the so-called Yakut Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic, was supposed to transform into an urban industrial center. Besides heavy industry, the five-year plans also called for developing transport. A railroad over 4,300 kilometers long, called the Baikal or Moore Mainline, was supposed to stretch from Lake Baikal to the Pacific Ocean, parallel to the Siberian Railroad. All of these projects were confronted with the problems of permafrost. So how did permafrost get in the way? Well, it became very clear to Soviet engineers that permafrost presented a host of problems for construction work. The land wreaked all kinds of havoc on buildings, roads, and other infrastructure. First of all, there was the problem that structures built on permafrost would sink and deform. This happened when the frozen earth lying underground beneath the structure was exposed to heat and thawed, causing the ground supporting the structure to subside. So to take one example, a report from the archives described what happened to a brick building that housed the local offices of the NKVD in the town of Yakutsk. The NKVD, of course, was the state ministry in charge of the secret police. The thawing of underground frozen earth caused the NKVD building to sink eight to nine centimeters, which in turn called, caused the building's walls to deform. One of the columns of the walls caved, causing the wall as a whole to shift, opening up a diagonal crack across the wall and scattering plaster all over the people working in the adjoining room. And that's just one example. Part of the problem was that buildings generated heat, which traveled to the ground and affected the permafrost, which then affected the buildings. It wasn't just the subsiding of the ground that caused problems, it was also the heaving, or pachenia, of the ground. This referred to the swelling of the ground during the cold months and its subsiding during the warm months. This happened in cold environments even where permafrost was not present. But Soviet engineers found that permafrost made heaving even more extreme and hard to predict. Basically, during the cold months, moisture in the ground froze and expanded. And when the ground was very saturated with water, this expansion could be substantial. The ground bulged and exerted pressure on structures sitting on top of it. This bulging was most extreme wherever a lot of groundwater collected. And since the permafrost layer underground was relatively impermeable to water, this meant that groundwater sometimes collected on top of it rather than flowing deeper underground. And this is why bulging could be more intense in places where there was permafrost than in places where there wasn't. But Soviet engineers couldn't necessarily tell where exactly groundwater would accumulate because underground permafrost diverted groundwater in surprising ways. Sometimes water collected in places where they were carrying out construction work. So for example, in the winter of 1927-28, a bulge or heave mound appeared at the 359 kilometer mark of the Amur Yakutia Highway in eastern Siberia. It measured 2.5 meters high, 68 meters long, and 22 meters wide. Thanks to this heave mound, the road embankment became lopsided, passage along the road was disrupted, there was also a bridge there under construction, and the heave mound destabilized the bridge as well, causing it to tilt. Just one example. One more problem 
I just mentioned that permafrost diverted groundwater in surprising ways and groundwater sometimes accumulated on top of the permafrost. Well, sometimes during the cold months, after a lot of the ground had frozen, groundwater continued to flow through interstices in the soil and rock. This water came from rivers or streams or underground sources and sometimes there was a lot of it. So you have a large volume of water looking for somewhere to go and small outlets because a lot of the ground had frozen. This combination of high water volume and small outlets led to a buildup of pressure in some places. This caused the groundwater to burst out into the open, flood onto the surrounding landscape, and quickly freeze, forming successive layers of ice. And this was called nalid, which gets translated into English as icings. Naled also had negative effects on infrastructure. For example, in 1934, near Skovorodino, a station on the Amur Railroad in eastern Siberia, a Naled appeared and caused the road to become flooded and encased in ice. Workers frantically worked to stop water from continuing to pour out of the ground onto the railroad tracks. They had to continually de-ice the railroad tracks to clear the way for trains. Trains that were sitting on the sidings froze to the tracks. Uh, so that's just one example. So those are some of the reasons why permafrost was a problem for socialist industrialization. Now let's turn to the propaganda. Soviet propaganda portrayed industrialization as a struggle against nature, and nature as something to be conquered. The, there were ideological reasons for this. The Soviet Union's official ideology, Marxism-Leninism, combined elements of Marxist thought with interpretations by Lenin and Stalin. With regard to nature and the environment, Marxism-Leninism promoted a few core assumptions. One, that humans were separate from nature, that they were engaged in a struggle with nature and the environment, and that humans could prevail over the obstacles presented by nature. So for Marx, the Soviets adopted the principle of dialectical materialism, which separated natural history from human history. Um, nature was the base upon which human history took place. Human economic activities were a superstructure. Uh, class struggle was the motor of historical progress. So Lenin took Marxism and injected a heavy dose of voluntarism, uh, th that is, belief in the unlimited potential of the human will. Humans could speed up the course of history, for example, by seizing power in a revolution. They could also overcome the obstacles posed by nature. The heroic struggle with nature became a dominant motif in Soviet propaganda during the five-year plans. The Communist Party called upon citizens to bend nature to their will. This was the rhetoric of conquest. The rhetoric of conquest was also applied to permafrost. For example, in 1938, the USSR Academy of Sciences published a book entitled The Conquest of the North, parentheses, in the region of permafrost. It was written by a scientist named Mikhail Sumgin and a journalist named Boris Demchinsky. The book demonstrates several ways that the rhetoric of conquest was applied to permafrost. First, it shows humans being engaged in a struggle with permafrost. Two, it uses anthropomorphism, portraying permafrost as a live opponent. And three, it endowed permafrost with agency, showing it to be something that was actively thwarting industrialization. For example, Sumgin and Demchinsky wrote in their book that there is hidden wealth in the earth, but permafrost stands as a sentinel, forbidding access to treasures. Thus, a struggle against it has begun. They characterized permafrost as a live enemy, writing that any work on the surface of the earth provokes a reaction on the part of permafrost. They emphasized permafrost's dangerous and dynamic features, warning that nowhere else on the globe is it possible to observe such peculiar and inexplicable violence on the part of water as in the regions of permafrost. So when people ventured into regions with permafrost, they crossed paths with an animate and hostile environment. In keeping with the idea of conquest, Sumgin and Demchinsky talked about how the Soviet Union might get rid of permafrost entirely in order to remove it as an obstacle to industrialization. For example, they calculated that in order to thaw two meters of frozen earth over 10 million square kilometers, it would take 60 billion tons of coal. Or assuming that permafrost layer was 50 meters thick, then eliminating it entirely would require burning 1.5 billion tons of coal every year for a thousand years. 
Simgin and Demchinsky talked about conquering, even eliminating permafrost. But what were Soviet scientists and engineers actually doing with permafrost on the ground? Well, I argue that if we look closely at what they were actually doing, we find that they were practicing adaptation. Sometimes this meant finding ways to cope with phenomena such as NALED, the icing I talked about earlier. Soviet workers took reactive steps like de-icing roads and infrastructure and buildings after they had already been covered by NALED. They also created barriers to divert and isolate NALED. One method involved utilizing frozen earth. Um, First, scientists study the land to find sources of NALED uh, near a construction site. This required careful surveying during the winter because NALED manifested itself during winter. Then, at a strategic location between the source of the NALED and the construction site, workers cleared the land and dug a canal or a trench. The idea is that, was that the land around the trenches would freeze more quickly and deeply during winter than the surrounding land would. Once frozen, the area around the trench would form a barrier to the flooding of a nullet. Water flowing downhill from the source of the nullet would be sequestered away from the structures on the other side of the trench. These trenches were called frozen earth belts or mislotni poyas. For example, along the Amor Yukutia Highway, engineers built trenches measuring up to 15 meters wide, a little less than a meter deep, and 200 meters in length. Besides these kinds of coping strategies, Soviet engineers also developed incremental adaptations. They aim to prevent permafrost from thawing and to minimize the ground's heaving. So quite contrary to destroying permafrost, this strategy was focused on preserving permafrost. The motive was of course utilitarian. Soviet engineers wanted to preserve the stability and integrity of their structures, prevent them from sinking and deforming. When it came to buildings, for example, Soviet engineers attempted to embed foundations deeply on the permafrost itself, while also preventing heat from the buildings from thawing the frozen earth. Embedding foundations deeply in the permafrost helped to minimize heaving in the layer above the permafrost. To prevent heat from the buildings from thawing the frozen earth, engineers used piles or vertical beams to elevate buildings off of the ground. So for example, in 1935, Soviet engineers built a four-story manufacturing facility in Yakutsk that incorporated these adaptations. They embedded the foundation four and a half meters into the ground on the permafrost. They used piles to lift the structure one and a half meters off of the ground. So raised floors and deep foundations became norms for construction in the region of permafrost. I argue that these methods, methods of coping and incremental adaptation, belie the rhetoric of conquest. Instead of defeating permafrost, Soviet engineers learned to adapt to the constraints of the permafrost environment. They had to accommodate frozen earth in the process of industrialization. They did so through trial and error and through carefully studying the land. They aim to preserve permafrost not because of any particular ethic of conservation, but out of utilitarian motives. So why did Soviet propaganda speak the language of conquest? The reasons become clear when we look at the history of science. In the 1920s and 30s, at the same time that the five-year plans were happening, permafrost science was emerging as a field in the Soviet Union. The two processes are actually intimately connected. Mikhail Sumgin, the scientist I mentioned earlier who co-wrote The Conquest of the North, is considered a founder of permafrost science. For Sumgin, the rhetoric of conquest was useful for establishing and attracting state resources to this new discipline of permafrost science. The more he emphasized the struggle with permafrost, the more he portrayed permafrost as a dangerous enemy to be defeated, the more he justified his expertise and the more state resources he attracted to an emerging field. He therefore had a motive to use the rhetoric of conquest. Sumgin was also the person who came up with the definition of permafrost I mentioned at the start of my talk, the now internationally accepted ground that remains out or below zero degrees Celsius for at least two consecutive years. This was a pretty abstract idea, but the image of a powerful, active phenomenon to be struggled against was very vivid. The image fostered by the rhetoric of permafrost helped to reify or to make concrete permafrost as an object in nature. So from a history of science perspective, the rhetoric of conquest served these important functions of performance and of creation.
So to conclude, the lessons that people have drawn from Soviet environmental history have been about the dangers and folly of wanting to conquer nature, and also the negative ecological consequences of totalitarian political ideologies. These are very useful lessons, but I want to suggest that there may be other takeaways as well. These are the idea that different ideologies can have a shared stake in accommodating human ambitions to the constraints of the non-human world, that adaptation is necessary and always imperfect, that is not something that happens once and for all, but is always ongoing. So instead of an alien experience or an aberration, the Soviet experience might just be a microcosm of our environmental conundrums today. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion.